Good evening and welcome to Lindsay Adario in conversation with Kathy Ryan. Lindsay, well, is the reason why you're here. And Kathy Ryan is the photo director of the New York Times Magazine. So we're going to have uh, this conversation, and I would like to ask you to silence your phones if you haven't already. And then just very briefly let you know what the Masters series is about and why Lindsay was chosen as this year's recipient. She's the 32nd Master in a series that began in 1988 because this college wanted to bring attention to the people who create visual content uh, that isn't necessarily fine art or stuff that everybody you know, knows about from museums, or, but stuff that's out there. So for instance, Lindsay's photographs um, from Darfur or from uh, Congo or from Ukraine. Many people, I guess most people, would not know it's the same photographer who did it. Or take this theater, this thing that you saw outside. It was designed by Milton Glaser. You, many of you may know he also did I Love New York. Did you know he also designed DC Comics? Or um, Brooklyn Beer? <laughs> um, Grand Union? And he co-founded New York Magazine. So he was one of the masters. And it's for these people we want to connect all the stuff that they've made with a name. So without any further ado, Kathy Ryan, Lindsay Adario. Enjoy your evening. Here we are. Let's start. Uh, all right, I'll start. I'll start. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying that uh, it's just a pleasure for me to be here this evening with Lindsay. We've worked together 20 years on numerous assignments for the New York Times Magazine. But we don't get the chance to sit down and talk like this. You know, most of the time when we're uh, engaged on a, an assignment for the magazine, Lindsay's off in a difficult place to work. We're on deadline. We're getting the pictures edited. You know, we're getting the job done. So I just, I'm very excited that um, we're here and we'll be able to chance about, uh, have a chance to talk about, you know, some of the big issues that uh, someone like Lindsay out in the field faces and, and the challenges. Um, uh, just to give you some example, uh, in the time that we've worked together, Lindsay's been to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Darfur, Iraq, Morocco, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, South Sudan, Ukraine, Yemen, and London for us. So she's, um, she's, been t she's done a lot of just uh, some of our most memorable photo assignments. So we're going to start today with the work that you've done in Ukraine. And uh, as Lindsay knows, I, when I saw the work first start appearing in the New York Times Daily, just to take an aside, I'm the director of photography on the magazine, and uh, don't work on any of the stories in the daily paper, although, of course, we have some interchange with our, the other photo editors there. Uh, I was glad to see Lindsay was there, but you know, sad for, our, for us that we didn't have Ron for the magazine. But Lindsay, tell us how that worked. How is it, you were the, one of the first, the first photojournalist there for the Times, right? How did you get there so quickly? I don't know if I was the first, but I, in December, uh, an editor at the New York Times at the Daily called me, or they emailed me and said, if there is a war in Ukraine, are you interested in going? And I thought, Sure. Uh, but of course, in, in the back of my head, I thought there's no way there, that this will actually happen because, you know, the international community is watching uh, Russians sort of mount troops on the borders of the Ukraine. They will not let the war happen. And so I said yes. And they went about and got military credentials. And that's quite it, it's it's actually um, 
was uh, the foresight was great because when the war did start on the 24th of February, I was already credentialed and was able to move around pretty freely. Um, and those credentials, for those of you who don't know, can sometimes take up to two weeks, if not longer. And that can really inhibit your movement if you don't have them. So I got in on the 14th of February and that was 10 days before the war started, and went directly to the east, because everyone thought uh, if the war starts, it will start in the east. And so I went out toward the line of contact. Uh, that is where there has been war since 2014. Um, so there is a lot of shelling, uh, constantly artillery rounds coming in, and a lot of those villages. And the people who live in the east are very well versed in the war, unfortunately. Um, they're sort of used to this, and so they don't express much fear. It's very hard to photograph in a place that's been at war so long because it's hard to get any emotion in the images and to really show how scary it is. Um, so when the war started, I went almost directly back to Kiev, which ended up uh, being under bombardment the entire time I was there for the remaining four weeks, that first stint. So these are some of those photos. Um, this is on the second day of the war. Uh, there was a call sort of for volunteers to fight. And I haven't seen anything like this in 20 years. Uh, people came out from all walks of life. Uh, and they continue to come out. And they continue to be resolute in fighting against Russia. And this is Julia. Uh, Yulia, she was a teacher of Ukrainian language. And I saw this group of women who were going to volunteer and followed them. And we finally got permission to photograph them as they were getting in the van to be transported to a base to sort of start the formal process. And she was crying. And I said, why are you crying? And she said, I'm scared. Uh, and I said, do you even know, have you ever used a gun? And she said, no, I'm a teacher. And I said, well, why are you here? And she said, because I need to fight for my country. And so... Um, so that was sort of, these are some of the initial scenes I saw. And then uh, as we're looking at this picture, one of the things that's defined Lindsay's career, in addition to the war photography and all the coverage of crises, is she's always drawn to the stories of the women and children in particular. So I was not surprised when I started to see when you're in Ukraine, that you were covering scenes like this. Tell us about this one. So this is um, in the early days of the war and almost sort of many times throughout the day there were sirens, people had to go into shelters. This is in a maternity hospital and all of the pregnant women and women who had literally just given birth had to go down into the basement every time that the siren went off. And essentially they were living in this moldy basement um, in those initial days of, that are supposed to be reserved for sort of, sort of one of the most precious times in your life. So um, this is a scene, the suburbs around Kiev, uh, Bucha, Irpin, now we're, we've seen the images that have come out of Bucha and what had happened there. And men, all we saw in Kiev, because we couldn't access those places, was that it was uh, rife with war. I mean, there was constantly thick black smoke rising out of Irpin and Bucha, constantly artillery rounds uh, happening sort of in the distance. Um, we knew that all of these civilians were fleeing out of European and Bucha to relative safety toward Kiev. There was this broken bridge. We saw many photographers photographing. Um, initially, I did not go the first few days because I was trying to sort of be safe in my coverage. And I, was, I, I wanted to see sort of, you know, is it safe to work there? So many photographers were going. And finally, I, I felt like I wasn't doing a good enough job in my coverage that I needed to get the civilian casualty uh, sort of the effect on civilians. And so I decided early Sunday morning, we made a plan. We would go very early. We left the hotel around 7.15, uh, got out there, and... I think also it might be great to tell them about the security protocols at the New York Times when you're on assignment. So when you were there, how does that work, particularly this war, where it became the, the security 
arrangements became much stricter than my memory of anything we've done. Yeah, this war has been, um, the, the New York Times makes sure that every photographer and writer team has a security advisor with them at all times when they leave the hotel. Um, and this was true in Kiev at the time as well because it was dangerous there. And so basically... Um, before we even go somewhere, we have to have a plan. Where are we going? Do we have all of our safety gear, helmets, vests? Uh, now we carry chemical hoods in case there's any sort of attack. Um, in case there's a, something at the nuclear plant, we have iodine tablets with us. We're always prepared for sort of anything that could go wrong. Um, we go through the route we will take toward the destination. We know when we get somewhere, we generally don't stay very long. Um, and so on this particular, this is um, on the day that um, I went toward the bridge, I thought, okay, this is relatively safe. I've seen all my colleagues have been going. I heard there was a lot of shelling, but most of it was staying within Bucha and Irpin, and that generally it doesn't cross sort of the bridge. And then I'll show a short video. So <laughs> When I, um, I saw that on the, you know, for the first time, just looking at my laptop in the morning and when it was on the homepage of the New York Times, I was the most terrified for Lindsay I've ever been because, of course, I watched I thought, oh, my God, it's Lindsay, and realized it was her in the frame and then felt so awful knowing that this family, some of them had been killed. Lindsay, tell us about this. Like, how do you photograph something like that. Like, what was going through your mind? So here, you were at tremendous risk yourself, which I would like to hear. How is it you were that close? And then... I think as we approached that morning, again, I sort of went toward it thinking, okay, I know that this is, there's, there's uh, shelling happening, but I didn't think it would come toward the bridge because in my head it was a known civilian evacuation route. So I assumed that the Russian troops would not target a place that women and children were fleeing. Of course, that was obviously very naive. Um, so when I went toward it, it just felt different. It didn't feel like uh, how my colleagues had described it to me. There was a lot of fighting. Um, it seemed like the the incoming rounds were were sort of not that far off. And so immediately we kind of, um, as we approached the bridge, there was a place like a wall off off to the side, sort of perpendicular to the bridge, and it was cement. And so immediately we decided to go there, so we had some cover from anything coming in. And we took a position there, and they were bringing out sort of wounded, and, and there were a lot of um, territorial defense sort of soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers, going to help the elderly and women and people who needed help crossing the bridge, because obviously it was very destroyed. And really shortly after arriving, arriving, a round came in and landed like probably 200 meters uh, off in the distance. And I thought, okay, they're not targeting the bridge. My security advisor, Steve, was like, do you want to leave? I said, no, they won't target the bridge because they know that this is where people are fleeing. And we had this position. And so literally within minutes, round after round came in. And each round got closer to us rather than further away. And I've worked in the war long enough to know that's bracketing. That is, that is a military term where if you are the person operating that artillery, you are zooming in on a target. And you get closer and closer with every round. And so at that point, it was too dangerous to try to leave. So we kind of stayed in that cubby. And every time a 
round came in, we would pop out and take photos. And then uh, suddenly a round landed literally in front of us, sort of equidistant from where the family that was ultimately killed uh, was standing. And I got sprayed with gravel. My whole neck got sprayed. And I thought that I was hit with shrapnel. So you can't really hear it. But in that video, the first thing I asked Andre is, am I bleeding? And he said, no, after I, and I, the other thing that I was thinking is that the soldier who had been in the frame was killed. I thought he was killed. And so that's why I was saying shit, because he disappeared. And then we saw Steve was able to drag him away. Um, I didn't realize a family had been killed until we crossed the street and sort of came upon them. And that's when I realized what had happened. I saw Steve obviously called for a medic, um, but you couldn't tell what was, what was in the distance until we came upon them. So yeah, I mean, once I, once I crossed the street, instinctively I said, okay, uh, I, I, the first thing I saw were these little shoes of a child and I thought, it's not possible. And I, I, one side of me just paused. And then the other side of me said, okay, I need to take these photos because I cannot believe what I just witnessed. And then I, the, like very, you know, I've been doing this so long and I thought, I also don't think these pictures will ever get published because, you know, it's very sensitive to photograph someone dying. And, and especially, uh, what we ultimately found out was a mother who two, her two children and a volunteer, a church volunteer. And so I kind of worked my way around uh, the scene to try to find an angle that would not be uh, too graphic, that would be respectful. And these are things that I'm actually thinking as I'm photographing. And kind of, and meanwhile, there were still rounds coming in. So Steve was telling us, you know, you have to work really quickly. And um, so I was shooting and then we had to run away from the scene as we were leaving. Um, we had to dive for cover several times because rounds came so close to us as we were leaving. How was it you were able to stay and continue covering? Just was it in the immediacy of the moment? You obviously <clears throat> were able I, to convince the security to let you make I, the pictures. I mean, I think once we were there, we were there. I mean, yeah. I think it ultimately would have been too dangerous to leave because then you're exposed. I mean, at least we were in a place that was, um, there was sort of a wall that was protecting us. And so I think um, this all happened in a matter of like, seconds. I mean, I approached, I shot, I moved, I shot, and then we left. I mean, it wasn't, yeah. we definitely weren't lingering. And then I was also in shock, you know, part of, uh, part of the, the, I was, I was really in shock. So I was operating really, um, a, a con on adrenaline, on adrenaline, really. Just some of it instinct based on, I mean, it's another thing covering this type of war how i can't stress enough how important it is to have somebody with the extensive experience that lindsay has because those decisions are made in seconds you know that you just have to go with instinct based on experience basically you know and this i just I, i'll say something you know when you we're in a, a, an unusual business obviously where you make a decision to put yourself at risk because you feel so strongly that the story has to get out there, that you have to bear witness, that people need to see how vicious this war is, that they're gunning down civilians. And it's very real. And when, when I saw this, and, and maybe because I wasn't involved in having you there that day, obviously you were there for the Times, it crossed over, I will say, from, uh, you know, and it's probably just because I'm older and years of doing this, of just getting more scared. And I I got so worried, I WhatsApped Lindsay and I said, listen, I am overwhelmed with the urge to text your mother. I just felt in that moment, I had to talk to, to and, and Lindsay's mom is here. And I said, is that okay? I just didn't, I just said, is it okay with you? And, and, and you said, yes, it was okay. And then you said, don't mention a video. <laughs> so, at which point, at least I, I didn't know if you had seen it. And I just, I, I only say that because there's, when you're doing this work and you're sending photographers and you're, you're going on faith that they'll make the right judgment call at, at a moment, okay, hopefully these moments like this don't happen. I mean, but they do when you're out there. Like, 
It, it's just, uh, it's for the larger cause, right, of journalism and what we do at the Times. And it, somebody, we need to make sure that somebody is there and reporting this. And yet, you get, it's hard. It gets harder because you start to realize the risk, of course, is so great. But, you know, nothing, you know, compared to, to clearly this poor family. And you've you've been in touch with a husband who wasn't there, right? Exactly. You, yes, tell them about that. <laughs> I think, um, well, first of all, I think it's also important to note, I because I was actually in the attack, I didn't realize how close it was because the mind is sort of very strong. And so I sort of was like, okay, maybe I wasn't that close. You know, maybe it wasn't so bad. And then I got to the hotel and I got a message from Clarissa Ward, who is a friend who works with CNN. And she said, oh my God, are you okay? And I said, I'm fine why? And she said, I saw the video. And I said, what video? And I had no idea that Andre Dubchuk was filming. Wow. And Andre was working with me. He's a videographer. He's Ukrainian. He's amazing. And we've worked together this whole war. But I had no idea he was rolling the entire time. And she said, there's a video of you on Facebook. And I, my heart just like stopped because the first thing I thought is, oh my God, I hope my, my parents don't see it. And then I thought, I hope Paul doesn't see it. And so <laughs> my, because because whenever I talk to my family, I don't say anything until I get home. And so I looked, she pulled out her phone. She, she's like, stay where, are you in the lobby? I said, yeah, she came down and she showed me the video and I just started crying because I was like, holy, wow, it was really close. And I didn't even realize it. And then, so the next day, uh, we kind of woke up and, and I was talking with Andrew Kramer, the, the bureau chief for the New York Times. And I said, you know, we should try to find out who this woman was, you know, like we should try and recreate her life, you know, rather than have the final image of her as her death, let's, let's piece her back together. Let's piece back her life. You know, who is she? Who was she? This is a human being. This is not just an image. And so Andre uh, was incredibly resourceful. He was able to find the godmother on Facebook. And then we went, uh, she had to go to the morgue and identify the family. Uh, he, the, fa the husband and father of the children was out of town with his sick mother. Uh, we asked if we can go see her at the hospital and we went and met her um, and it was very very emotional and then we, she said it'll take uh, the husband a few days to get back here he was in the east and so we we uh, waited and then we went and met the husband and father and had this very emotional conversation with him Andrew interviewed him and and then uh, you know it was it was pretty overwhelming because it's important and it also was important for me to sort of I don't know get his blessing for having taken this photo I mean this is you know the worst moment arguably of his life and it will sit with him forever because I took that photograph and so that's something that I also have to live with and I know and we'll see other situations where when you're photographing people in difficult circumstances We'll talk about how you get consent. Clearly, in that moment, you didn't have the opportunity. But then, of course, you, you connected with the, with the husband later. But um, so the here, uh, still in Ukraine, how do you mentally prepare to go on assignment for something like that? Like, can, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, every trip has been so different. I've now made three trips. Uh, I just got back on Saturday from my last trip there. Um, every one has been very different. The second trip was more focused on the east and, and also in the south, documenting people coming out of Mariupol, which was under siege, um, and also trying to cover some of the frontline stuff. It's very difficult to cover the frontline stuff. Access opened up a lot more right after I left. Um, but even so, it's it's hard because it's an artillery war. That means that you basically watch people loading uh, machines and firing off, and you see a big flame. But you never, you don't really see kind of emotion, or you don't. It's very hard to get to sort of the heart of this war because most of the civilians have left the east, um, and. So it's just been very difficult uh, visually to capture this war in a compelling way. Um, on this particular day, we, uh, we were trying to get to the front. Um, it's also the Ukrainian military is very closed in what they show journalists. Uh, we were able to get this group of the 
Carpathian Sitch. It's a group that decided to take us up. Um, we met with the commanders. It was the only time in the entire war where we sat at a table with maps, with, with commanders. They said, these are our positions. This is where we'll take you. This is the road there. Generally, we just sort of show up and they're like, oh, sure, let's go to this position. And yeah, the Russians are right there and maybe they'll hit you and maybe they won't. But this was actually the first time where it was really organized. Um, we had to drive about five miles um, on a road where there were Russian tanks positioned toward that road. So we drove as fast as possible, um, got there, and the commander said, when, you, when the car stops, run into the bunker as fast as you can. We got into this building, and we were two floors below ground. The building next to us got hit with a tank round. The minute we walked in, the entire building shook, and I thought, okay, this is where it collapses on our heads. And then this is... It was incredible because there was an entire base underground. And uh, this is a drone operator going through some of the footage. And it was really sort of the first time I had seen, I, I had felt sort of like I was bearing witness to something close and more intimate. And these are some of the people coming out of Mariupol. Um, and they would drive. They had Many of them had to go through 35 checkpoints to get out, to get to Ukrainian territory. So they were emotionally and physically sort of destroyed. Many of them had been living underground for more than a month, had not seen the sky, had not. They were completely traumatized when they arrived. And this is from the last trip. Um, and on something like that, maybe you could say something about how, how you get the consent. So you're photographing someone at a funeral. How does that unfold? So How do you this make that is connection. It it's sort of a it, it unfolds in various stages. So first we get permission to actually go as the family is coming in. Andre usually stops whoever is uh, you know either the wife or the mother and asks permission. Introduces us as the New York Times. Uh, it's very important that they know what publication and that it will be published uh, not only in print but also online because I think that it goes you know sometimes people say oh it's an American newspaper. Paper, we'll never see it here and you have to actually clarify no it will be everywhere it could be on Facebook because that's kind of the universal language and then once you get inside of course you have to gauge who actually feels comfortable with photos so it's it's a step-by-step -step process but people are pretty clear about telling you right away if they don't want to be photographed and and of course I just respect that and then this is recently, there was the tank parade, all of the Russian captured vehicles that were out, uh, they were put on the main street in Kiev for Ukrainians to sort of climb on and play with and have fun. And it was really just a, um, an affront to the Russians saying, okay, you know, you haven't won. So. So here we've got, okay, we're gonna go back to the very beginning of Lindsay's career and, uh, Within days after the attack on the World Trade Center, I got a phone call from a young photographer, Lindsay Adario, who I didn't know at the time, pitching an incredible story. So of course, the Times Magazine, all news organizations were working around the clock, obviously frantically covering this historic event and figuring out what were the next stories to do. And she proposed, Lindsay had been spending time, tell them you had, it, t tell them what you had been doing, and then she had a, th a thought for us. So basically in 2000, I moved to India, and almost just a few months after moving there, I uh, had a roommate at the time that I was renting a room from, and he said, you know, you're a woman, and you care about women's issues. You should go photograph women under the Taliban. And I thought, oh, that's really great. Okay, I'll go to Afghanistan. So I went, um, borrowed money from my sister, and went. And so I made three trips to Afghanistan under the Taliban before September 11th and was working a lot in Pakistan as well and in Peshawar, which was at the border. And so when September 11th happened, I felt I had pretty good contacts and I felt very comfortable working in that region. Um, it was I hadn't really worked for the New York Times yet. It was really my first kind of break with the New York Times um, where I... Um, 
after w- when the attacks happened, I was living in Mexico. I took the first plane back to New York. I was working with Marcel Saba at the time. I stopped at my agency, and Marcel, who ran the agency Saba, handed me a digital camera, and he said, you shoot Nikon, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, here's a Canon. It's your first digital camera, and here's a manual, and l- learn how to use it on the plane, and you're going to shoot digital from now on. <laughs> and I said, okay. So I went. And, um, and this was the story that I thought, I felt like, you know, I wanted to understand what people were thinking in their homes, you know, what were they thinking about the attacks of September 11th from their perspective? You wanted to hear from the women in particular. So let's say the wives uh, uh, of the men who were, uh, you know, pro, pro pro the attack, and there were remarkable quotes from some of the uh, women, including the one in the upper. And by the way, these are color photos. You're about, this is, those are the spreads we ran. So here you see the actual pictures. We couldn't find the original copy of that issue of the magazine. We, anyway, but beautiful color work. Aunt Lindsay's first big assignment for us. And she just had the foresight to say, you know what, there's a story in the wives and the women, and the and the pictures were amazing, and the interviews were remarkable. Like yeah. talking about wanting her sons, any of them, to become martyrs because that was a greater cause. It was really illuminating. It was a revealing. Uh, mm-hmm. fo- it was a photo essay that I had a lot to it. Uh, in addition to the pictures, there was there was a lot to be learned. Actually, that you weren't getting in other reporting, which extraordinary accomplishment for a photographer of how old at that point. So, God, maybe third. I was born in '73. Okay. Anyway, I'm just. It, 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 does, it does. Yeah, that's why. Someone do the math. We're not in math. Yeah, it doesn't matter the age, but I've always wondered, like, where did you get the confidence first to send yourself to Pakistan to begin working? Because one of the ways photojournalists break into the field is coming upon a story that nobody else has embraced in a way. So Lindsay was out there ahead of others. I mean, yes, the Taliban were newsworthy, but not nothing like what happened after September 11, where, of course, everybody, everybody knew who they were. And that was interesting because I was photographing a lot of these women and families. And, and then when, uh, when the Americans started bombing in Afghanistan, a few days later, my access just shut down. And all they said, you know, go, we don't want you here. We don't want any Americans around. And that was kind of my first experience with that. And I was like, but wait, it's not me. It's, it's my government. And they did, there was no access. It just shut down entirely. So this is 2005, I think. Yeah. And this is the work in Darfur. Darfur. And this was when there was tremendous fighting going on, I think, between uh, different factions, right? Uh, this you is, probably. yeah, and working in Darfur, the access was incredibly difficult. Uh, the Sudanese government didn't necessarily want journalists there. Uh, President Bashir uh, was often bombing his own people um, across Darfur. Um, the war was, uh, for many reasons, but as many wars are, also access to water, land, uh, resources. And so um, often the government would bomb a village and then send one of his, one of the tribes allied with the government um, in on horseback, men on horseback to go in and pillage and rape women and steal everything from the homes. And so to access a scene like this was incredibly difficult. We were able to go with the African Union peacekeepers at the time. Um, I remember this particular village, we tried to get in for several days and every time we approached, we were shot uh, shot at by the Janjaweed, who were literally in the village, and the peacekeepers couldn't do anything, which was shocking to me because if you know if you're we're out, if you're with the UN and you're trying to approach a village and you get shot at, you know you have no mandate to shoot back or to do anything back. So that was very frustrating, and we knew that a lot of people had been killed, and we finally got in, and in fact there were dozens of people who had been killed in this village, and so these are many of the people who had been displaced. 
Um, and I started working in Darfur in 2004 and worked there uh, for six straight years. So when every year, um, sometimes I had to walk in from Chad, cross rivers. Sometimes I did get a visa from the government. Sometimes I got a visa, but then spent a month waiting for a permit to work. Sometimes the same guy who gave me the permit to photograph arrested me this, the next day for photographing uh, and took all my cards from me. So it was completely, um, it, it was very difficult to work there. And so, um, this is a situation in 2006 uh, when I was on assignment for the newspaper and President Bashir, uh, we had heard that a lot of Sudanese government soldiers had been killed by Darfur rebels. And President Bashir said, absolutely not, it's not true. And I happened to be in Chad with Lydia Polgreen for the paper. And we went to the border and found a truck, of, truck full of rebels and said, hey, did this really happen? And they said, yeah. And we said, well, can you take us to the site? Because we can't really report on it until we see it. And they said, well, it's really dangerous because there are Antonov aircraft flying overhead. And if the government sees one of our trucks, they'll probably drop a bomb on us. And we said, well, we just need to get there and we can be very quick and come back. And so we got in the back of their pickup truck and went. And as we drove toward the site, there were literally bodies everywhere. And it was incredible because it was, you know, it was one of my first experiences with a government just blatantly lying and saying, like, no, this didn't happen. And then I took this picture and it was on the front page of the New York Times the next day. And it sort of, you know, Bashir had to sort of walk back what he had been saying. You know, and a lot of thought obviously uh, goes into when to publish pictures of bodies on the front page of the Times or when, especially with Ukraine recently, I'm sure there are many discussions in the newsroom of what's too much. And yet here, as Lindsay's saying in this case, it was evidentiary. It was proof of what was going on. It had a news value that was important. So I just wanted to stress that because I think it's hard. There's just so much war and, and you, you know, you have to report on it and sometimes that involves showing uh, the, the corpses. But there's, it's, it, uh, there's a lot of effort taken to try and be thoughtful about it, uh, yeah. and what to show and what not to show. And I know that that's something you think about a lot. You know. A lot. I think also in Ukraine, it's been uh, a constant sort of discussion. Uh, a lot of photos that have never been published because they're too graphic. Uh, places like Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine, uh, there was a time where every single day there was sort of uh, a lot of photographers went to Kharkiv because you sort of, the, it was, uh, you could go and there was, every day there was an attack and there was an aftermath and the photos were very dramatic. But at some point, it's like, like, you know, it's almost disrespectful to every day just photograph bodies and bodies and bodies. I mean, there has to be a narrative. There has to be, you know, there, there's a respect involved. And so it is a very difficult balance because you also need to show the war, which is death. But it's sort of, there's a trade-off, you know. I think it's really important to not have it just be sort of gratuitous every single day. So this was a cover story that we did. It was a it was a big project where Lindsay and Elizabeth Rubin went to Afghanistan to the Korengal Valley at the height of the uh, the fighting when the when the Americans were there, and uh, the initial assignment. You, this was there was a lot of discussion, of course, about the fact that a certain amount of the American air raids and bombing was killing civilians, and why was this happening? So the idea was in the reporting and the photography to try to get to, uh, it, by spending weeks with the soldiers and the command, you'll, you'll see in a minute, like sort of in the command outpost, what was happening that these civilian deaths, these, these mistakes were happening. And um, it's a particularly interesting one because uh, Lindsay can talk about what it was like as really to be there with with the men for so long and then let, let's keep going. We'll, we're going to come back to this picture here of one of the boys. Go ahead. So um, we, first of all, we when we asked to go to the Korangal Valley, uh, at that point, it was the place where the United States was dropping the most bombs in the country. And I went with Elizabeth, and we went to the public affairs officer and said, um, you know, we'd like to go to the Korangal Valley. And the press officer sort of looked at Elizabeth and I and was like, mm, 
it's not really a place that's fit for women. And we were like, why? <laughs> you know, we have experience. And they were like, mm, there's no place for you to sleep or go to the bathroom. And we were like, well, where do the men sleep? And where do the men go to the bathroom? And we basically convinced them that we could, we could go there. And uh, at that point, women were not, uh, the Pentagon would not allow women soldiers on the front line, but there was not the same mandate for journalists, of course. So we went back the next day, and we were very lucky because Colonel Oslan, who was the commander of the Korngal Valley, had this, and had this philosophy of transparency. And he believed that if the American public could see and understand the nuances of war, they would understand why so many civilians were getting killed. And so he allowed us to go to this place and live in bunkers with the troops on the side of the mountain for two months. And so uh, when we arrived, first we started in the command center. There was uh, a battle going on. There were troops in contact. We were watching it on the screen. And the, the commanders made a decision to drop two 500-pound bombs on that village. And so when we went the next morning, this is this child, along with his sibling and other other civilians, were being brought to the base. We asked to go directly to that base. We're being brought to the base for treatment by the soldiers, saying they had been wounded in the bombing the night before. So it all kind of checked out. I took these pictures, and then we ended up staying for two months. And so this is, you know, we we went all over the Korngal Valley. Uh, you know, we were constantly under fire, whether it was mortar rounds coming in or gun battles. We would go on six, seven-hour-a-day patrols, and it all com- it all sort of culminated with Operation Rock Avalanche, which, um, which, um, if anyone has seen the movie Restrepo by Tim Hetherington, the late Tim Hetherington and Sebastian Younger, which was totally brilliant, the the documentary. Um, that was the the Operation Rock Avalanche. And the idea was to go and jump out of helicopters in the middle of the night into the heart of Taliban territory, assuming the Taliban would fire at us so that the U.S. military could fire back, and it would basically show their positions. And so we this is the first night we got there. Um, we jumped out of the helicopters. I couldn't believe I survived that because it wasn't high off the ground, but I'm only five feet tall. So even if you're just hovering, like I ended up with like, you know, people jumping on top of me and my, it's pitch black and it's all through night vision. And so we started walking and right away, um, we were with the, the command and right away, Captain Kearney, who was in charge of the troops started getting a uh, word that there were, that there was a, the, there were, um, I guess, Taliban very close by. And so we stopped and there was all this conversation. And for a photographer, there's nothing more annoying than being in this situation and knowing how something really fascinating is going on. And there's absolutely nothing to shoot because you're in the pitch black on the side of a mountain, like risking your life and freezing and there was nothing to shoot. So I fell asleep because I've learned also in war that you sleep when you can and you eat when you can. And so I just sat down and fell asleep. And then uh, like an hour later, I heard Captain Kearney saying, Adaria, wake up, we're sparkling. And I sort of woke up and put my night vision on, and this is what I saw. And what you're looking at is this is a, a Air Force, and he's sparkling a target with a laser that's visible only through night vision goggles. And this is so the attack aircraft can fire on that target. So it just helps the attack aircraft sort of walk onto that target. I took that picture and then fell back asleep. And then... <laughs> Uh, they ended up dropping bombs, and then this is, we went into that village the next day because civilians were killed, and the idea for Kearney and the Americans was to go in and to meet the villagers and explain to them why it happened and to sort of explain uh, we were, you know, they were being targeted, and that's why they went into the village. And this is sort of the total disconnect between the U.S. military and Afghan villagers. That's them listening to the commanders explaining. And then on the sixth day, we were ambushed. Uh, we were hit from three sides. And this is sort of the aftermath of that, of that ambush. And that's uh, carrying Rugel's body through. This, on this one, I remember being very struck when you said, uh, at this point, Lindsay had spent so much time with the soldiers. She knew many of them well. And you had said that Sergeant Rugel had been telling you a day or two before he was 
planning to propose to his girlfriend back home. I always like think of that every time I see this picture. Yeah. But, it's, um, yeah. And I'm, I think this was also a case, right, where you kind of looked and then asked the men, can I, can I make this photo? Like wanting to add a respect to them, to, you knew it was an important picture and it's obviously an extraordinary image. This uh, is such a sensitive moment. I mean, there are very few moments as sensitive as being with soldiers when uh, one of their comrades has been killed because it's often their sort of best friend or someone that it, it's a very emotional moment. And um, I didn't realize it was Rugal. Um, we heard it was very chaotic in the ambush and we heard that three people were hit, but I didn't connect the dots. And so when they were walking toward me, I realized this is the scout team and Rugal wasn't with them. And so I realized he was dead and I started crying and uh, Clenard, who's on the left, was crying. And I stopped and I said, can I, can I take this photo? And he said, yeah. And so I was shooting as, you know, as they were walking to the medevac to evacuate the body. You know, and I'm just going to point out there, clearly it takes, again, incredible, uh, an incredible eye and understanding. Like it's, uh, it's a timeless picture and it's always hard when you say timeless, but really it, it could be. World War II, and it's kind of like everything coalesced, as Lindsay does all the time in incredibly chaotic situations. Remember, photojournalists, they have to somehow make some sense of it, some order out of it. And in this case, again, split second, I assume you were walking backwards downhill while making the picture. And again, I just pointed out because, so, you know, tonight is just so, I think, helpful to stand back and think about what went through your head, how you're able to do this, you know, under a situation like this, to see the power of it. I mean, uh, the smoke and all of it adds up to a, a kind of um, just sadly, you know, timeless old masters like image of war. Um, I was, and mind you, I was terrified when the shooting started. So, and I also had gone up. This is a lot of information for a room full of strangers, but this is, we had been, I had gone up to find a place to pee. And so I had left my cameras on the side of the ridge and had climbed up because the ridge line was like perpendicular almost. It was about 70 degrees like this. And the only place as a woman to go to the bathroom is you had to find like a log that had fallen over or something. And so I had crawled up on my hands and knees up the mountain and left my cameras, my helmet, everything when the ambush started, I had just jumped over this log and bullets started coming in like a wall of bullets. And so I ended up waiting for a moment and terrified that the Taliban was going to come upon me first from the top. And then there was sort of a lull in the, in the bullets. And I just rolled down the mountain, literally like just put my hands out and rolled all the way down because I didn't want to stand up. And then when I popped up, there was sticked, one of the soldiers was there and he's like, get behind a tree. He was screaming at me. And I was like, but I need my cameras and I need my helmet. And I was trying to get my cameras and my helmet. And then I saw Elizabeth out of the corner of my eye and I ran over and she and Tim Hetherington were behind a tree that was like literally this thick. <laughs> and I thought, well, that doesn't really help. You know, everyone was like huddled behind this tiny little tree. And then they were very narrow as you can see. Yeah. On, should we talk about the the boy, or I don't know. No, okay. <laughs> anyway, we end. We'll, well, that's another story. We can maybe yeah. some will ask. Which was really just about the choice of image for the for the cover on that story, which ended up being Captain Kearney, because it was all about the American soldiers and the decision making that was leading to the errors. And and Lindsay felt strongly that the power, the emotional power of the little boy's face, which had clearly been wounded somehow. It was the the best choice for a cover, and I agreed. And but then it, it was an unusual situation where the inability to get like a confirmation of what had caused his wounds. Anyway, we we didn't end up using it on the cover, and it's always been something that Lindsay and I talk about every time. Regret. It was a powerful, powerful. It's painful picture. to talk about. It's pain, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Painful. So we're we're gonna we're gonna switch to. Uh, this was a big project that we did in the magazine about, oh, what would that be, five years ago? And it was a story that Jake Silverstein, the editor-in-chief, wanted to do on the displaced. As you know, uh, there are a tremendous number of refugees, and at this moment in time, there are 60 million displaced people 
and 30 million of them were children, our children. I'm sure it's the same number, if not greater, today. So the idea was to find three individual children in three different places where chaos had ensued, whether it was war or, you know, you, you'll see in a second, and to have Lindsay go and photograph them. And Lindsay will talk about it. It was, you know, again, a big part of what you try to do in your work is get behind the, the, the anonymous pictures, that some of it by definition will be that, but there are people behind these stories. And Lindsay has always tried to come up with intimate stories that tell you about the individuals. So it was the perfect match. So clearly, obviously, uh, I thought of her immediately for this. And then she set out and uh, will tell you the stories. This is Hana, a Syrian refugee yeah. in a camp in Lebanon. Tell them about Hana. So Hannah was, she was 12, right? I think she was 11. She, I think she was 11 or 12. 11 or and 12. And again, three, there will be three different children featured. She's the one of the three. And she yep. was living in a camp in Lebanon, and every day she had to wake up at about 4 in the morning, and this is her getting ready to go for work, um, because so many of the Syrian refugees who were displaced to Lebanon had to work to try to get food. And she, um, so it was really just sort of the ritual of her life. And every day... Um, I spent, I would get up at 3.30, be at her house by 4, go with her to work, spend the day with her. And in this situation, uh, she would come home from work and take a nap. And I remember taking this picture and waking up next to her. <laughs> I actually fell asleep <laughs> right next to her <laughs> and then woke up and then uh, sort of getting ready. And, and it's really about her life, you know. I mean, it's important for me to try to get those little moments where she's just a girl, you know. She's just a child and it's not, you know, she's living a life that she should not be living, you know. Children should not be getting up at 4 o'clock to work every day. Um, and this is Oleg, and this is in eastern Ukraine. This is in the um, in the uh, in the DNR in Ukraine. Um, and so this was in 2015, uh, a year after the war started in 2014. And uh, this is Oleg sitting in his former school uh, and walking around the village. And this is the first and only time I had been to Ukraine before now, before the war started this year. Uh, and this is children playing war games uh, in the village. And wearing, right, some of the clothing and stuff they have, they find discarded in the fields from the fighting, which is just such a sad picture, but also an incredibly beautiful one. It's like you got the, there's a lyricism to it because yeah. it's the kids and the light. And um, it was one of the things with this story that was important from a photo editing point of view that, there wasn't going to be a lot of dramatic action, right? That many, many hours go by when you're in a refugee camp like Hana in, in, uh, uh, in Lebanon, and there's not much happening. Clearly, Lindsay Dario can make unbelievable pictures of dramatic action unfolding, but she also has a very, very poetic and lyrical eye, so she can see the beauty in the everyday. And I just always thought this was such a, um, I don't know, just a beautifully captured moment in the same way the picture of Hana under the netting, I assume was mosquito netting, asleep. That it, I don't know, It's like Lindsay understands all of the horror that led in this case to their situation, fleeing the fighting in Ukraine, and, and uh, but somehow also just can always see beauty. And I emphasize that because, and we'll talk about more about this in a minute too, like it's just hard now to get people to keep looking, right? Because they're uh, just flooded with images. We see more images in a day than any other generation in history. And how do you get people to still pay attention? And some of that is about, again, being able to organize visually with artistry some of the chaos. And I know that is always awkward to talk about in connection with uh, harsh, difficult, horrific imagery, which sometimes you have to make because you're covering war. And then, oh, th so this is exactly the one to switch to. So here you see Chaul in South Sudan, whose family had to flee the fighting. And Lindsay, and again, I just know this well because we work so closely. She, he, his, he and his grandmother fled, and they became separated from his mother. They were fleeing, fleeing through the swamps, and somehow Chaul and the grandma end up in one camp. 
No, the what part. happened was so uh, this is when the Sudanese government, the South Sudanese government, yeah. was going into villages in Lair and um, and killing people and burning villages, much like I'd seen in yep. Darfur. And so when Chowell's village was attacked, he and his grandmother jumped into the swamp and they watched while the soldiers rounded up his father and his uncle and put them in a th- in a hut and set them a lot set them on fire and killed them in front of him. And so he and his grandmother and one of his sisters, he had eight other siblings, um, they swam and they went through the swamps for almost two months. They were fleeing and trying to make their way uh, to this place where we met them called Nial, which is in the Sud, which is one, I think, the world's biggest swamp. And eventually they were trying to make it to Kenya, where they had relatives in a refugee camp, the Kakuma refugee camp. So when we met them, he had been uh, fleeing. He was obviously traumatized. He knew his father was dead. He had no idea if his mother was still alive because he, when he left, the, the government was still in his village and there was fighting everywhere. So he had no idea of his eight siblings and his mother survived. And so we spent um, like, I think five days in Nial. This is literally just a patch of dry land in the middle of the swamp. We flew in on UN helicopters, had to bring our own food and water. Um, and there was nothing there. Literally, there were some local villagers and, and then they were sort of housing the displaced from Lair. And so, you know, Chol was the oldest son, the oldest male in the family when his father was killed. So imagine when he was 12, uh, or I think we had nine in the story, but it's very difficult because often they don't know their ages. But at his age, he was the man of the family. And so he had to then provide for his family, which was incredible because imagine you've just survived, you've just watched your father get killed, and now you've got to figure out how to keep, you know, feed your grandmother and your sister alone in this strange place. And so this is him and that community of Nial. And I always uh, remember there was something in our story where it uh, spoke to the fact that he was so inspired by the humanitarian workers he was hoping to study to be a doctor. Remember that? So yeah. cute. Well, on the last day, this is, and Chol didn't speak any English, obviously, and so we had one translator, but often when I was with him, I was just alone with him and photographing, and we couldn't really talk. We couldn't say anything, but we would just, like, hang out. And on the last day, I was leaving the next morning, and I was photographing playing uh, soccer, and I went to say goodbye, and he said, wait. And I was like, okay. So I just sat like on the side of the, you know, dirt road and I waited and like an hour went by and I thought, where did he go? He ran off. And I thought, where is he going? There's not like nowhere to go really, you know? And he came back like an hour later holding two chickens, two live chickens. And he said, I just wanted you to have a good meal when you, like before you leave. He said that when we got back to the camp and the translator translated that that's what he wanted. So he went and found two chickens so I can eat good, eat a good dinner. And it was the cutest thing. I literally, I, of course I burst into tears. (laughs) It was, that was very sweet. So then um, about a year later, um, I got an assignment from Time magazine to go to Lair, and that's where his family was from. And I thought, um, I initially we, would, we were going to go to this place that we heard was like the killing fields. I mean, we heard that no journalists had been able to go there. No one had been able to go because the South Sudanese government wouldn't even let humanitarian workers go there. Uh, Nick Kristoff, the, the columnist for the Times, was able to get in um, about a week before us and said and that there were skeletons everywhere. It was just this horrific place. And so I had this idea that if I'm going to this place, maybe I can find Chol's mother and see if she's actually alive. And uh, I thought, okay, this is never going to be possible. But I was in touch with Chol because... Every time I spend time with someone, I give them my phone number and my email, and I say, like, you know, 
if I can ever do anything, call me, you know? And of course, in Chol's case, his grandmother had worked for an NGO and she spoke a little bit of English. So they're not really, um, in, in that part of the world, they're not aware so much of time differences. So after I met Chol and his grandmother and sister, my phone would ring literally at two in the morning, three in the morning, and it'd be like, Miss Lindsay, you know, we, we made it to Kenya. Miss Lindsay, Chol's in school. And they would always, you know, they would call me all the time with updates. So when I got this assignment for time, I called Chol's grandmother, Angelina, and I said, what is your daughter's name, you know, and what's the village name? And she told me, and I said, okay, uh, I'm going to Lair, and maybe I can find her. And they had no communication because there were no phones. She lived in the bush. There was no communication. And one person had a satellite phone in the entire area of Lair. And so um, I went there, and I thought, there's no way. And, and I went with... Um, I forgot which, we were with one of the humanitarian organizations and they were doing a food distribution the next day. And I went to one of the aid workers and I said, you know, I have the name of this woman and her village name. Do you think she would be at this food distribution? And he said, well, it's the first food distribution in three months and there are 17,000 people coming. So if she's alive, she'll be there because everybody's hungry. And I said, okay, well, do you think you can find her? And he's like, yo, yeah, if she's alive, we'll find her. And I was like, how are you going to find her? All you have is her name and there are 17,000 people. So literally we got there at dawn and people were coming from all stretches of the horizon and I thought there's no way you know so I'm standing there and I'm photographing and then the guy comes up to me and he said we found Chol's mother and I said it's no way there's not like I don't believe it so we went and we were I went up to her and I asked her a million questions you know where are you from how many kids do you have where's your husband I asked her a million questions and halfway through the conversation I realized it was actually her and I started crying and she's looking at me and she's like what's wrong with this girl? Like, why is she crying? And I had brought a copy of the New York Times magazine with me in case I found her. And so I didn't have it there, but I had it back at the camp. And so I said, can I come visit you tomorrow? And she said, yes. And I brought the copy of the magazine. I had to find the one car in all of Lair. And I got, I hired the guy. I went out to her village and I showed up and I brought the magazine. And this is me at the house. And this is Chol's mother and eight siblings. And that's them looking at the cover of the magazine. And when they saw the magazine, everybody just started crying. And they were like, he's alive, he's alive, he made it. And everyone was crying. And I thought, wow, what do I do now? Like, how can I connect them, you know? And so I said to Chol's mom, um, you know, maybe I can record a video message of you and I can fly to Kenya and bring, you know, at least you can, you can say something to him. And so she sort of sat up and fixed her dress and I set up the camera and she said, Chol, don't come home, get educated and then come home when you finish high school. And that was amazing to me because it's just the sacrifices that these mothers make. And that's me and her, which is hilarious because... <laughs> Everyone's really tall. <laughs> and that's me bringing the video of his mom to Chol in Kenya. And so Kathy backed this, and, and it was amazing because it was such a privilege to be able to go back um, and to connect them. And Chol didn't cry, and he just sat there, and he looked at the video of his mother, and it had been a year, you know. And I said, so what do you think? And this is him in school in Kenya. And I said, so what do you think? And he said, I must study so I can support my family. And I thought, wow, it was incredible. So that was Chol. That was Chol. We have that, the, cover, the, the uh, cover photo you saw right at the beginning of the story is hanging up in the office. It's one of just a handful of big framed uh, prints we made, that beautiful cover where he's in the swamp. And it's so, so beautiful. And then this is a tough story in Yemen. Uh, uh, it was about five years ago. 2018. 2018. So how, no. I'm too, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so I'm not too far off. Yeah. And uh, that was when there was tremendous um, famine happening. And fighting. And fighting. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and so Yemen is also very hard to access. A lot of these yep. stories, a lot of the issues for these stories and 
you know, Marianne, Elizabeth and the audience, you know, it's the hardest part is getting into these places, getting visas for these places, getting to the people, getting to the story. Uh, and then there are often a lot of restrictions on the ground. This is with the Houthis, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the groups in, in Yemen, and they are incredibly paranoid about journalists. So we were followed everywhere and every single thing I photographed was, you know, I had a minder sort of on top of me the entire time. And so it's difficult, you know, in a lot of these stories, uh, there is not much freedom of movement. We can't really just go where we want and access what we want to tell a story. And so these are a lot of the displaced people. People have been displaced from fighting, from hunger, um, and have moved into different parts of uh of the city in Sana'a. And this is a young girl who was in a bombing attack and was burned. Uh, and again, I think it's really important to note that it is almost always the civilians who are paying the prices of these wars. Yep. And that's the last of the pictures that uh, we're showing this evening. And again, they, everything you've seen here was for the New York Times. Stop on and people. everything but Ukraine was for the magazine. So I just emphasize that because Lindsay's done other terrific work for Time and National Geographic and other publications, uh, again, on other subjects like the maternal mortality and others. So I just, oh, and then this, of course, is Joel, the beautiful picture, which I, I don't know, I just feel like it. this image sums up what, what you do. Like you go to this very inaccessible, difficult place and there's something about the individual in the picture that we it just touches our hearts and, and I don't know, just the way you framed it and, and he seems so vulnerable on that little like uh, rough hewn canoe or boat there just going through the swamp and probably remembering what he had experienced when he was fleeing and I uh, just always, it's a very beautiful, beautiful picture. So we could, I, I, we could talk either more ourselves, just questions, or maybe it's a good moment to open it up to, yeah. to everyone. Are there people who have questions that you would like to ask Lindsay while or we're- you. <laughs> or, or, or me. Or, or me. Not only me. I want, we all want to hear from you, right? <laughs> it's you, you we want to hear from. I think yes. Hello. Hi, Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Um, I was just wondering about your perspective on photo activism versus photojournalism. Um, a lot of photojournalists in my generation, I think, are confusing the two. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really damaging to the relationship with the public. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering your perspective on that. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think it's important, um, you know, uh, it's not to say my mind is neutral, but I think it's important for the work to be neutral and for me to, you know, again, I think access is an issue. It's hard to document two sides of a story or various sides of a story if I can only access one side. But I think even within that that access I get, it's important that the coverage be, you know, accurate, that it's factually correct. You know, it's not only about taking a photograph, but it's about doing the reporting. It's about actually getting getting the facts straight and making sure they're accurate. And so I think it is important to not be an activist. For me, you know, that's not, I'm, I'm a journalist first and foremost, and I think everyone has their own sort of path. But I think for me, as a representative of whatever publication I'm working for, whether it's New York Times, National Geographic, Time, I think it's important for me to uh, not, you know, insert my own opinions into that coverage because it's, that's not my job, you know. My job is to sort of present what's happening and let the public decide. You know, and I, I sometimes think of y your activism is the photography, yeah. like basically an activist on behalf of humanity or an activist against injustice by going out to make pictures to say, this is unjust, this is wrong, and that's your activism. It's not right. raising money for the cause necessarily, but basically making the imagery that will show people this is actually happening and that it hopefully 
is a you know a, a catalyst for change in many right. situations. Exactly. You know. So it's not like I'm going out and then I will go raise money. But certainly when I cover a topic like maternal mortality, my goal is that there is some sort of change that the maternal death numbers will go down. And in the case of Mama Cisse, if you can if you have time to go see the exhibition. Um, you know, we talk, there's a, there's a photo essay on a young woman who dies in childbirth. And that essay was one of the inspirations for starting Merck for Mothers. And they put aside $500 million to start Merck for Mothers, uh, when they saw that photo essay. And so it was, you know, that as horrible as Mama Cisse's death was, and as tragic, it was, not you know it wasn't in vain in the sense that it did help other women in Sierra Leone to not face those similar conditions you know it's one thing i've noticed also over the years working with photographers that again that uncomfortable question that arises like about publishing a picture of the worst moments in some family's life or a mother the mother who's lost her baby's life it's hard on the other hand often the people caught up in those situations want the picture, like particularly I've found over the years when it involves a soldier who's essentially given up his life for a cause, for his country, that as awful as it is at the moment, the family sometimes is grateful ultimately that there was a documentation Absolutely. of their son. And you have stayed in touch with some of the parents, for example, yeah. of the American soldiers in Afghanistan. So I just mention that because I always think like that for me would be if I weren't a a, a, a journalist myself, like it would be a question, wow, what was it like? You know, the poor parents, and it is tough. On the other hand, people, if they've been caught up in something like that, they, they to have the document is means something. Yeah. So that in itself has meaning to the people caught. What else? I know you had a question. Do it. Hey, um, this might be a question for both of you. Um, when you go to, so you get an assignment in Ukraine, for example, how big is your team? Is this just you saying, oh, let's go over there? Or do you have a producer mm. is there? How big is your? Sure. So um, generally, it's um, for the paper, for example, we're paired up with a writer. Uh, they pair up writers and photographers, but we have very different needs, um, writers and photographers. Often the, the writer would prefer to stay at the hotel and do the reporting with phone calls or just come out for a short amount of time and then go back and write, whereas photographers always want to be on the ground seeing you know seeing life on the street seeing what's happening being as close as we can get to wherever we need to be and so that means we're out you know all day every day and so I often um, will hire my own driver or my own like a local journalist for example I've been working with Andre this entire time um, and he is a journalist and videographer and so my team was me him a security guard um, Steve, the first time we were out, it varies, depends who's available, and sometimes a writer, sometimes not. So it's not very big. It's just, you know, and the less people, the better. Although I'll, I'll jump in, because I think also your question was about how it starts. And like with Ukraine, as, as Lindsay was saying in the beginning, the paper could see the war coming. So they had started to lay the plans and had reached out to Lindsay in December, mm -hmm. like long before the Russians, not long, but quite a, quite a long time before the Russians invaded. And uh, so the, in, there's an international desk with an international editor who's got a number of editors around the world working for the Times. And then there's a very large team of photo editors on the daily, and then we're a separate team for the magazine. We have slightly different missions in the sense that the paper is, particularly with that war, was you know putting stuff up online, changing it up hourly, as you saw. The magazine tends to be a little bit more long form, so in our case, there's a weekly ideas meeting where writers uh, pitch ideas, editors pitch ideas, photo editors pitch ideas, or photographers. So if a photographer had an idea, they would maybe pitch it to me, then I would take it to the ideas uh, meeting. And um, and then the editor green lights it, whether to do it or not. So we did a couple big uh, features out of Ukraine also. I couldn't work with Lindsay, much to my dismay, because she was already spoken for with the paper. But 
we had a terrific, we needed to figure, and the magazine moves more slowly because it's long form, maybe it's a 10,000 word piece. So we have to do something different. Like we can't report the immediate news. Everything we do has to be like a larger takeout on something or we have to be so far ahead of something it anticipates the news. But our lead time, we go on press a week and a half before we come out, the print version. We can obviously go faster with digital, but not as quickly as the as the paper. Just they have a much. It's a very large team, and there are I, I don't even know like uh, many photo editors. You know, international photo editors, culture photo editors, uh, metro photo editors. You know, uh, special projects. The um, photo editing team on the magazine is is generally usually there's uh, like five or six of us at work and different stories are split up and, and we, again, would have often a, uh, a longer time frame to produce them. Uh, and when we did our first story in Ukraine, I, I needed to figure out what we could do because we couldn't cover the actual action because it was being brilliantly covered by Lindsay and others for the paper. So I uh, ended up assigning Alexander Chekmanev, a Ukrainian photographer who had lived in Kyiv for decades, which also helped us in terms of security needs. And he's mainly a, a portraitist, his work. He's not uh, someone who goes out and covers combat. And so it was a very nice addition to the Times mm. coverage. It, we went at it in a different way. He did the people living underground in the subways, uh, train conductor, you know, different uh, it, resident. This was when Kiev was under attack, residents mm. of Kiev. So it's a big operation where the ideas start with the editors, but phot photographers are always welcome to pitch. And if you've got a newsworthy idea, that nobody else has thought of or you have special access to, uh, that's and a, and, a, and a good eye and ability to, to execute it. That's what we're on the lookout for all the time. And the paper also has four, generally, since the beginning of the war, they've had four photographers and four writers at least in country at all times. So that's, that's a good a point. Like you can, the paper can do that kind of full coverage. The yeah. magazine doesn't do that. We send a photographer writer team with a specific idea of a magazine kind mm. of piece that will supplement. Uh, you want to go ahead? Uh, hey there. I got, I got the mic. Right. Oh, okay. Um, hi there. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm a student in print photo here at SVA, and I often face this dilemma where lately, like when this, especially with this Ukraine war, how I can just scour the internet and find hundreds of videos from just people being there that live there, just on their phone, like, documenting everything that's going on, things that are like basically where there's like Russian bases that you just see like people strewn everywhere and it's horrible graphic imagery. And a lot of it is video. And we see in this digital world with like TikTok, Instagram reels where it's just like really quick things and I often find myself just like losing the attention to things that like, the you know, the Ukraine war is important but it just feels so fast. Like I, I often can't find a way to care about it because it just, there's so much going on, and you guys brought it up earlier. So, I'm just curious what you, you know, your thoughts on like how things should move, or how you think things will move, especially in this more video world, where and I'm not on the ground there, but there I saw that you had a videographer with you. But is that how everyone is doing it, or and like no. where do you think things will go, and maybe what do you think is the best way for things to go? I mean, it's awesome. difficult. I mean, that's what someone like me is struggling with, who's been covering, uh, who's been covering Ukraine since February, is how to continue covering it in a compelling way. Because I think people are sort of have stopped paying attention, you know. And I think yes, because there are so many images coming out, but also because at some point you have to have a different angle or you have to be showing the world uh, something new or something more intimate or something different. And I think it's a struggle. It's a struggle for um, to not only come up with those ideas, but also to continue making new images and images that hold people's attention. Because it's not only us covering it. Like you said, there are a lot of Ukrainians just putting out a lot of videos and, and photographs every day. Um, and, you know, the Ukrainian press corps, well, I think what you're referring to is probably like citizen journalists or just regular people, but also the Ukrainian press corps is pretty incredible. I mean, they have been, because the country's been at war since 2014, they have a lot of very brave and very good photographers and journalists on the ground uh, doing incredible coverage. And so I think that's also, you know, we're sort of going in 
uh, and trying to uh, sort of supplement that coverage as well. You know, and I, th I think it, you, part of your question was about video. And it is, a, it's a constant challenge in the sense that we're now, for example, on the magazine publishing in several formats and the digital, digital format obviously calls for video clips of some sort as, and clearly the, again, the Times at Large is doing some great stuff. And it's, it is, it's hard to compete with what's out there in the sense that you see so much and it's there in your pocket and lots of citizen journalists are contributing interesting material. I think, I think what we can bring to it is, is uh, hopefully an ability to organize what's happening into a way that is illuminating. So that, or hmm. timing has something to do with it. So like the picture that Lindsay, because of who she is, her experience, and being in the right place in the right time, like for example, at, with the, um, the family that was killed on the, who, who were supposed to be getting safe pa passage in Irpine, she was there to make that at exactly the moment the world needed to see that, which is why I'm sure it was at the top of the homepage. So a, a professional journalist like Lindsay br brings that to the world at a moment when people weren't really realizing the extent to which that kind of thing was happening. And then, like Lindsay was alluding to, it gets really hard when weeks go by, months go by, years go by. Look how many years the US was in Afghanistan. How do you keep returning? It's equally, it's and same thing in Ukraine now. People are still dying, it's still important, and that's one of the challenges we face. How do you find new stories that uh, shed more light on it that people mm. will keep paying attention and looking at because a fatigue does set in? And again, one of I think the toughest challenges is figuring out how to get people to keep looking, keep mm -hmm. reading, keep wanting more information, uh, so that again, hopefully, the war will come to an end, get, or yeah. you know, aid will be delivered to a place that's desperately in need of it, or again, whatever uh, case may be. I don't, yeah, I'm on. I thought I was pushing the wrong way. Um, the images are beautiful, and the instinct to composition is wonderful. Uh, Thank you. When when you're out in fast moving places, um, how do you have some kind of a sense of formula of how you're presetting your uh, your camera for the right combination of all the things we know about? Yeah, I think. Um, I think when I'm approaching a scene, I'm I'm getting sort of the light reading and the aperture ready um, just in case something happens and I have to just respond quickly. So generally, I'll just make sure, uh, and this is just because I've messed up so many photos over the years and I haven't been prepared. Um, now I've learned, like... 40 years later, um, to set the the shutter speed quickly so in case there is something moving very fast, you know, I'm at 500th of a second or something, and, and the aperture to comp compensate. And so, yes, I do have the camera sort of ready um, as I'm approaching a situation. It does. The light doesn't tend to change very fast unless I'm going indoor and outdoor. So at least if I have the exposure and everything ready, then then I'm just looking for the right moment, you know, and often I'm shooting a lot. One thing that was interesting that we did um, with the exhibit is um, if uh, there is the video uh, that we showed tonight, there is the cover of the New York Times, but we also... Uh, put on a screen every single frame that I shot leading up to that moment and after. And so you can see how I kind of approached it. And so it's it's almost like a, a, a moving picture because there's so I shot a lot. I was obviously listening to the security advisor, so I was told to stay behind the wall so I couldn't go close right away. So you see me sort of shooting from where I was. But it's interesting looking at the approach and sort of how I moved around the the family. I think that's also important that the mention that you at, that, at a moment like that you fired off as many frames as you could. Yeah, like, I just yeah. Thought sometimes I think I people don't realize it's yeah. not like you do one or two. You just you know you have to go for it, and you're 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 making many quick quick compositional decisions, not knowing for sure what will ultimately uh, come through. 
that moment when he says to you, get back. I tell him, like, no, it was you. I'm like, it's Lindsay. He's telling her to get back. But obviously, you still managed. To yeah, but that's, I mean. The security guard now. If you, th when I think about the first time I was under fire in 2003, it was Iraq. And I was so scared, I forgot to take pictures. And so I didn't take any pictures. And I was in this big gun battle, and I witnessed all these amazing things. And I still see the whole scene in front of me. And I, don't, I didn't have one picture because I was so scared. And I forgot. Like, I was just worried about trying to stay alive and stay. And I, you know, the directive was we were in the back of this seven-ton open back truck with the Marines. And I had actually just been kidnapped. And in order to not get kidnapped, again, we decided to embed with the U.S. military, which was uh, probably the dumbest decision ever. But we went with the U.S. military and we were sent to the village that we had been kidnapped in. And so for the Marines to do this operation. So I said, okay, no, we will not go to that village because we convinced them to release us because we're journalists. So if we show up there with the military, any other journalists will get killed. And they were like, okay, we'll send you to a nearby village, which is right outside of Fallujah. And we went in the middle of the night. We were in the back of this open, uh, this open seven-ton truck with 17 Marines. And we took off at 2.30 in the morning, so it was pitch black. And we were getting these orders from the commander in the pitch black saying, you know, he gives all of the Marines their orders. You know, this is what's going to happen. We're going to go to this village, whatever. And then I hear this voice saying, journalists. Yes, you will be shot at and you will be rocketed. So when it happens, jump out the backside of the truck. And I was like, oh, my God. So we lo and behold, we drive into this village in the pitch black and we watch the sun come up and the Marines are watching the insurgents mount an ambush on our truck and kept saying, like, Commander, permission to fire. No, you can't fire until you've been fired on first. And I was like, please let them fire, you know? But of course, they were on their best behavior because they had the New York Times in the back of their truck. So we were literally waiting to be fired upon. And at some point, a rocket flew right over our heads. And it was like Armageddon. We're in the back of this truck. Half of the Marines did what they were told. They jumped out the backside of the truck. My colleague jumped out the backside of the truck, left me in the truck. <laughs> And all of the Marines facing the, the, the ambush started opening fire on the, on the thing. So I'm lying in the back of this truck looking up at the sky with hot bullet casings landing on my face saying, I've got to get out of the truck. I've got to get out of the truck. But I was too scared to move. So I'm just lying there with all these bullet casings landing on my face. Never took one picture. Didn't even think of taking a photo. And was literally like, I have to get out of the truck. So finally, I picked up my own leg because I was so scared. I picked up my own leg and was like, get out of the truck. And then I finally climbed, I managed to climb to the side, jumped over the side of the truck, and was dangling off the back of the truck. But the truck was like 12 feet off the ground, and I'm five feet tall. So there was like all this space, and I'm in a flak jacket, helmet, I'm carrying my cameras. I mean, finally, my colleague came and helped me down, and we jumped into a ditch, an irrigation ditch, and there's like a massive gun battle. I still haven't taken a photo, not one photo. <laughs> I never took a photo until the end, like literally until it was like really boring. And I get like this one picture of like soldiers shooting their guns. But it was a huge mistake. I mean, I, I don't know why I was ever hired again, but <laughs> I missed that entire shoot. <laughs> but it would have been great. <laughs> I still remember it. I just have no pictures. <laughs> The one time. The one time. It's a wonder you have But that helped me with, with, you know, in Ukraine because I was like, okay, you have to take photos. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if your approach to image making has changed as the internet becomes a more prominent source to spread information. You know, you're obviously documenting a lot of heavy subject matter, and I assume that you feel a certain amount of responsibility doing your work. Um, and I wonder if that has changed for you as more and more people can see what you're doing and can gain access to the work that you're doing. Yeah, I think I have to be a lot more careful with consent and making sure that the people I photograph understand that no matter what I shoot can be seen by everyone. And so I think it's important because I remember when I was shooting uh, in Afghanistan under the Taliban 22 years ago, um, 
you know, most people were very open to being photographed because there was no internet, there were no newspapers, all all sorts of entertainment were banned under the Taliban, there was no TV, there was nothing. So people were quite open to being photographed because they knew those images would never get back to Afghanistan. And now with internet, Facebook, everything, people, everybody says no because they know that those images will be seen. So even if I'm in a place where the people are not aware, I have to be very careful and just explain like, you know, this will be seen by everyone. I think, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, um, that was my question as well on the informed consent issue. I used to do this type of work as well back in the day, but, uh, you know, it's the same thing. People would never see the images. So I was wondering, with respect to that, what kinds of situations would you seek or do you seek informed consent for? Because, you know, there are a lot of cultures where people, uh, you know, there's a power dynamic of not feeling as though they can say no to someone like mm -hmm. you. So how do you anticipate that? Which situations would you seek informed consent for? And then also, I was curious, you know, there are some situations, like for example, in the case of, the, of, the, um, of the, those being killed by the shelling, are there situations where even if you didn't get informed consent, are there pictures that are so important you would go ahead and take them and then push the editors to publish them. Well, Here. that was the example, right? The family on the Irpin Bridge. I mean, I think that sort of, uh, I felt it was so important for the world to see what was happening and that these are civilians being targeted that, you know, there was a risk that the, you know, we didn't know who was, who was, who those people were. We didn't know if there were other relatives. We didn't know if that... I initially thought the man in the photo was the husband, so I thought it was a husband, wife, and two kids, but in fact it wasn't. Obviously, we later learned, and so one of the concerns of the New York Times was, of course, like, what if the family finds out, or what if someone finds out through this photograph that their family had been killed, and in fact the husband saw images on Twitter and then saw my picture, so he found out through Twitter and then my picture sort of confirmed it to him and so I think yes there are moments where uh, where it, you know in that situation where it's a fluid situation it's war you know you're in public your people are being killed around you you take the picture you know I think when I'm going into a situation and and I'm asking consent if it's someone if it's a power dynamic thing and they you know, they feel like they have to say yes. Often I ask the people around them. I ask family members. I ask NGOs or organizations who have been working within that community, um, who trauma counselors, you know, they're often psychosocial counselors, counselors. I think I try to also involve other people so it's not just that person. Um, but it's hard, you know. It's, it's not... You know, I hope I'm making the right decision, but it's, you know, it's not, who knows? I, I do my best, and I and I always try to hope that I'm doing, you know, that people who give me consent are really giving me consent. You know, and there's a couple layers of that. So the first being the, the photojournalist, Lindsay, on the ground, and then usually I would say the answer is if they've given consent then, but if there's a question of some sort, there will be a very thoughtful uh, process at the Times amongst the editors to figure out should we or shouldn't we publish it. And the New York Times has a standards editor who's, who is the person we go to when it's a particularly thorny question of, of a moment with, for some reason, a, should we publish the photo or not. So that's one other uh, stage in that before making a decision if it's one where, you know, obviously we wouldn't publish something that would put someone at risk. So that's a key thing. But then if there's a, uh, I can't think of a case right away, but you know when it was tricky was covering COVID in the hospitals in New York when the magazine did it because at the height of it, we had a photographer, Philip Montgomery, they in there, but some of the patients were incapacitated and normally you'd be able to ask family members, right? But the family members weren't allowed to be in the building because of the COVID. Remember when, at the moment when everything was so strict? So that was one where we were very, yeah. very careful. And, and then, and of course, yeah. it was patients, so they have, you know, HIPAA rights. So right. uh, I just remember that 
that was a particularly unusual situation, but of course you face that a lot. It's not like you can always go back to the scene yeah. of the, uh, the, the the crisis and find somebody if you couldn't well, find them. Well, this is day. interesting. There's a there's an image in the exhibition. Uh, I covered COVID in the UK, and the UK. It was incredible to me how uh, the 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 government in the UK really censored COVID in the beginning and was in complete denial that it was actually happening. The UK ended up with one of the highest death rates in Europe, if not the world. And I and I think that it when I finally did get into hospitals, you know, going through the consent process was very difficult. And there was one hospital that I went to um, where the hospital had identified patients who gave their consent ahead of time. And so those are the patients I focused on. And there was one patient, William, who had been a scientist and he was only 50 and he was, um, he was in the hospital and he was on an ECMO machine. And so that is, uh, a machine that takes, I think, six people to operate it. It essentially does the job of the heart. No, it does the job of the lungs and heart for the body so that it gives the body a chance to rest. And it's it's an incredible, like it's, you know, literally a person who is being kept alive by these machines. And William gave Sounds like the consent. ventilator. No, nope. it's beyond a ventilator. It's way beyond. It's it's if you look at some of the images, it's and so William had given his consent, and I think because he was a scientist, he felt it was really important to document this time in history. And so I went and I spent a day with him, and I took all these pictures of him, and um, and then I called to interview his wife, and his wife was really mad that he gave consent. She was really kind of upset, and you know he believed it was really important to. Show show the world what had happened and so or like what was going on and he died after like after I took those photos and the wife was like she she hadn't wanted those photos to be taken so it puts me in a very kind of awkward situation because you know obviously he's a 50 year old man who was you know very conscious and still communicating with the nurses and he wanted those pictures taken and so ultimately i i defer to him you know rather than the wife um this um this is well it's way louder than i expected oh, sorry uh, <laughs> i'm here um i so appreciate lindsay this i feel like the story with cho goes beyond consent, you really took the extra step to go see if you could find his mother, take the paper with you, find a car, and then, you know, close the loop by going to find him with a video, which is really amazing and says so much about you as a human. Um, but what is that like to keep in touch with sources? Because you've given so many personal examples where they all have your cell phone or your WhatsApp or your signal. And I imagine... 20 years ago, the kind of, I don't want to call it a burden, but the expectations around those relationships was probably different. So as more of the world is connected, how is that changing how you handle those relationships after you spend days with people? I mean, I'm, I'm open to it. I mean, sometimes I can't respond because I'm in Ukraine or sometimes I can't, you know, I, I think sometimes I have to say like, you know, I, I'm not available right now, but it's why wouldn't I be open to it? You know, I'm walking into people's most vulnerable moments in their lives and most sort of like, you know, some of their darkest moments and they let me in. So it seems sort of hypocritical to not open myself up to them, you know? So I think that that's, yeah. I mean, sure, it gets a lot to have my phone ringed all hours and have people calling from all over the world. But I think, you know, now... I, I, it doesn't, you know, it, it's who I am. I, it doesn't bother me. I mean, people have been so generous with their lives and, and, and opening themselves up to me and the rest of the world through my camera. So, uh, Your work's remarkable. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for, for the images that have really helped us right. appreciate uh, the world around us and I imagine that where you are now in your career that you must be in great demand and I wonder how no, you not really <laughs> well I'm, I'm sure you're in demand <laughs> how do you select how do you select your the projects that are put uh, forward uh, for you and and what's your next major project that we have to look forward to 
Um, it's still hard. You know, a lot of the publications have closed down. There aren't that many publications that still assign work um, overseas and in conflict and and the type of work I like to do. Um, and so it's not that easy to get assignments and to get work and to get this backing for the stories I like to do. Um, I think for the foreseeable future, I'll probably keep going in and out of Ukraine. I mean, I'm pretty invested in it. Um, and then I, you know, there are stories that I'm pitching now um, and some of them have to do with climate, drought, you know, but I think I don't always get backing for those, you know, so then I have to make the decision, like, do I send myself or do I wait, you know, if it's a dangerous place or a place where, you know, it's hard to go on your own because if something goes wrong, you do want the backing of a publication, you know, if, if it's dangerous. Um, so I think right now, um, my focus has so been on this exhibition, Perry. I mean, we have not like from working nonstop to get, you know, this opened. And, and I think, you know, now I'll start, start looking toward beyond Ukraine, where else I'll go. But I never really know, you know, ahead of time. One thing I do know, Lindsay would love to do more work in the U.S., so we're hoping yeah. to maybe connect. She, yeah. She's done a little bit for us early on. That We didn't obviously show all the stories tonight, but we hope to do something together in the U.S. Would love to. Not sure what yet. We're open to ideas. Um, oh, this is a video. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd also like to show gratitude for the work that you've done. You, you really inspired me, and um, I'm pretty sure everyone can say that as well. Um, my main question, really, is how do you separate your professional life from your personal life, especially the career that you have? You know, how do you go back home and just sleep? <laughs> you know. Um. First of all, I never had a personal life until like a few years ago, <laughs> until like 10 years ago. I think most of my, it, it always makes me laugh when I give a talk and, and there are students in the audience who are like, you know, I want to be a photographer, but I have a boyfriend and, you know, I'm worried he's going to break up with me. And I'm like, dump him. <laughs> like, you're not, you're never going to have a personal life. So if you want to be a photographer, just be single, like assume you're going to be single most of your life, you know? <laughs> And I think it's, you know, you have to make a lot of sacrifices. And it's, it's um, you know, it took me years to get to the point where I felt comfortable even saying no to an assignment. And I still basically feel bad about it. Um, when I go home from an assignment, I try really hard to sort of just go home and be present. You know, often that means my first trip out of Ukraine, um, I was there for six weeks and I was desperately trying to get home for my son's music concert and I hadn't been home in six weeks and I got home from the airport I went in the house took a shower put on a dress put on lipstick and went to the school and it was literally like within an hour of getting home you know so I'm trying always to sort of be present when I can but I'm not home a lot you know I mean in the last six months I've been gone more than half of that and so that um, obviously takes a toll you know I'm not a typical mother I'm not a typical parent who's uh, home and and I miss my kids first day of school you know I miss major mile you know major things and it's hard you know it's hard to juggle Lindsay, how do you deal with some of the, oh, what would you call it, the stresses of, like, just when you come back, does, you know, the, thinking about what you witnessed, how does that, how do you balance that? Like, you're home, and it's a whole different reality from what you were just experiencing for those six weeks. How do you handle that? Uh, I don't know. I think I've just been doing it so long. I, I naturally sort of just try to be present wherever I am. It's not that I, you know, I, my husband who's here somewhere, I mean, he gets embarrassed because I'll sort of like break down and cry at the most inopportune moments, you know. <laughs> Obviously, there's some degree of PTSD and there's some, I'm very emotional, you know, so sometimes I'll just be doing something and it'll trigger something that I've witnessed and I'll feel that, you know, and so I think it's a, oh yeah, what is that? Lynn's 
Lindsay told me last week, at one point she was rushing from something to something, and she had just left the dentist where she found out she has to get four crowns from grinding her teeth at night. So <laughs> That's just She said it was okay, you? I could share that, but it does say <laughs> that there is something in this superhuman woman <laughs> I'm like, I think I'm fine. I, I, you know, I'm okay. And then my dentist is like, you've cracked all your back teeth. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think, you know, I, for me, it's really about just trying to be present and trying to, um, you know, not compartmentalize, not forget what I've seen, but to just be wherever I am and, and sort of give myself fully to that wherever I am. Hi, Lindsay. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. I have just been, you've been one of my professional idols for so long, and I just admire your work so Sorry. much. Um, I took a bus from D.C. today to, to be here, and I, re I read you. your memoir for the second time tonight Aww. on the way. Wow. And uh, I just, wow. your story in this space um, as a woman has been so valuable for me as a young journalist myself. And so nice. I guess I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit on your experience in a mostly male dominated fields, this, this area of journalism specifically. Yeah. Um, I, uh, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for coming and for reading the book and for everything you said. Um, I, yeah, it's it's hard because there aren't that many more women than there were when I first started. There are in Ukraine. There were, um, you know, Carol Guzzi was there, who's you know amazing, and Paula Bronstein, Aaron Treib, uh, Nicole Tung, you know. But I can basically count them on my hands. You know, there aren't that many women, and kind of everywhere I go, I'm surrounded by fifty men, and it's. You know, it's unfortunate we're still in that place. And I think I everyone always asks why. I can't really answer that question. I think it comes from both sides. I think, um, you know, it's physically and emotionally grueling. Um, I think it's, um, it's a tough life to lead. And especially if you do want a personal life, if you want a family and children, it's definitely hard to find a husband like mine who will stay home with the kids when I'm off in the field. I think, um, I think also I have to say, I have to put some blame on editors. Sorry, Kathy. I think a lot of editors don't send women into combat and maybe there's this sort of unconscious just bias of like, I'm not going to send a woman to combat because maybe it's too dangerous. And I myself am guilty of that. Like when I see women, you know, in a really dangerous place like myself, I'm like, wow, that's so badass. But it's like, that's what I'm doing. You know, you, I still have that kind of, I can't believe that women do some of the things that, you know, and that, where does that come from? I don't know. You know, it comes from years of us being told that, you know, this is a man's profession and it's whatever. But I think it's hard because there still aren't that many women in the field. Yeah. But I don't know. I guess for me, it would be sending a man. Is he as good as Lindsay? Can, is he as brave as Lindsay is? Can he actually? No. But, you know. Also, people should realize Lindsay does a lot of uh, physical working out and stuff to be ready. You know, she's carrying like 30, 40 pounds of gear when she's on those treks with soldiers and stuff. Like, I, I always think that's interesting for people to remember. Yeah. Like, you're, in addition to the tremendous courage and incredible eye, that it, you physically also have to, like you said, keep up. And, but, uh, I mean, you're remarkable. So, you can, you can do it all. embarrassing um on that note you are very phenomenal i'm so happy that i got to sit here and listen to everything that you have oh, to say thank you um i wanted to ask a question on like how you push past the fear of like going from like being so scared of like not taking any pictures and then going back into the film like i'm going to capture everything even while i'm in the like pursuit of everything that's going on so how did you get past that I mean, I still get past it with every yeah. assignment. You know, I still get very scared. I mean, there is nothing not scary about being under mortar fire or mm -hmm. shelling. You know, just last week I was at the nuclear plant and there was shelling all around me, you know, and I think it's terrifying. And I, 
and it doesn't get less scary. I think um, sometimes when I'm in that situation day after day, of course I get a little jaded and I feel more sort of comfortable. And but I think, um, but I think I just have to sort of stay focused and try to identify sort of you know my first reaction always when something happens is where's that coming from? How far is it? Mm -hmm. You know, I have to kind of get my situational awareness right away because that helps me that helps sort of allay the fear because then I understand how scared I should really be mm -hmm. you know and I think so rather than just freak out I kind of just try to get very grounded and figure out where things are coming from and where I can go if something happens and like look for cover look for a place to be um, but I'm constantly pushing past that fear it's not something that goes away uh, over time it's something that is kind of with me on every assignment but now I photograph. <laughs> no, I don't forget. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, so it strikes me that when you're talking about all of these really horrific experiences, you're doing it in a very matter-of-fact way. And I wondered... Does it take a while to get to the point where you've processed some of these things so that you can talk about them that way? Or is it just kind of you get home and it's over and... No. I, I think it's my character to talk through everything. Like people who know me, obviously. <laughs> I talk about everything very openly, and I think that's part of the process. I think that's part of processing the trauma of what I've seen is talking about it and being very open about it. And I think that's actually helped me um, kind of uh, to process what I've been through, you know. And I think even with the European family and the, you know, uh, being kidnapped and, you know, writing the memoir, I think all of that is part of the process of, of processing trauma and uh, what I've witnessed and what I've personally been through. One last question. I just wanted to say um, thank you very, very much for being here. And uh, I find your work super commendable and inspiring and really uh, encapsulating of the human experience and just it, it's really illuminating to see the images that you've produced and uh, I want to say thank you for that. Um, I, I guess I have like a kind of two question thing. My first question is um, do they allow you or are you allowed to be armed in the field? No. Okay. Thank you. No journalists carry weapons. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then um, if there is to be a conflict in Taiwan, as I'm sure you've seen the news, I'm curious, do you see yourself covering that? Not really, no. I don't. I haven't really worked in Asia, and I, I think I've been, most of my career has been Middle East, Africa, um, now Europe, but I, I think not, no, it's kind of way beyond my my area of interest, like I mostly focus on Middle East Africa. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Kathy. And um, do go visit the exhibition. It's the Master Series Lindsay Adario at the SVA Gallery. 601 West 26th Street on the 15th floor. We're open six days a week from 10 to 6. Thank you. Thanks.